Oh, precious Father, we worship, we worship, we worship and adore you. We glorify your holy name. We thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you because the entrance of your word gives light. Breathe upon your word. Speak to us. For our ears are open and attentive to hear you. Lord, your word is so precious in our sight. We thank you for opening our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Today, I've come with a word that is very simply and aptly titled, Power Over Power. Power over power. I was preaching in the city of Nottingham this morning. We've been there for the whole weekend, my wife and I. And um, this is what the Lord put in our hearts to share with the people. And I recognize that this is something that is needed in the body of Christ in general. And for you in particular, wherever you are connected from. Hallelujah. I believe that this is indeed a word from God for you. Can somebody help me look at your neighbor and say power over power? Power over power. power. Hallelujah. Now, I may not be able to get the scriptures on the screen, so please open your Bibles with me as we read along so that you can see what the Lord is saying. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter number one, this is an introduction to just give you a picture of the point we are trying to make. This is not the main scripture, but just to frame a, 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 a context for us. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the very first words of the scripture says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and it was void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw the light that it was good. Let's go to the book of Judges chapter number 5 and verse 14. And it says, some came, and in case you're wondering what this is all about, this is a song of victory from Deborah, from Deborah, from the, the, the prophetess that God used to motivate the nation at a time of great need and war. And after the victory and Sisera was killed, and after Israel was liberated from their oppressors, a prophetic word came, a prophetic song came upon her lips, and she began to sing. Now, this song was not her reporting what she saw. The fact that it was a prophecy, that's why it's in the scripture, as a prophecy. The fact that it's a prophecy it tells us she was speaking from God's perspective. So, this is God's point of view. This is God's um, observation of what the accounts of the events were. He says, some came from Ephraim whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed. And Makir captains, from Makir captains came down. From Zebulon were those who bear a commander's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, rushing after him into the valley. But in the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of hearts. Why, oh why, did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks in the districts of Reuben? There was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan and Dan. Why? Why did he linger by the ships? Asia remained on the coast and stayed in his caves. But the people of Zebulon risked their lives and so did Naphtali on the heights of the field. It's interesting that this would be God's perspective. Twelve tribes. And of the 12 tribes, only around half of them actually went into battle. Dan, the man of commerce, the Bible says he stayed by his ships. And sometimes that's how we are. Some people are so preoccupied with business that they refuse the summons of the Almighty. We hear of Asha remaining on holiday. It says Asha remained in the coast. Asha, Asha was busy getting suntan while the nation was being delivered. But of all the different excuses that we see why some people did not engage 
in the mission of the moment, the one that intrigues me the most is the person who was actually supposed to be the leader of the bunch. I'm talking about Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Reuben. Reuben, that the Bible will say, his father says, the excellency of my power, my strength and my staff, Reuben. As firstborn, it was he that had the God-ordained position to lead. But yet the Bible says, but in the midst or in the districts of Reuben, rather than go to battle, there was great searchings of heart. Great musings, great thinking, Professor Ruben. And we see Genesis. If Ruben were God, in Genesis chapter 1 that says, in the beginning the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Ruben would have just said, let's analyze this situation. Let us, you know, be able to critically examine how did this situation happen? What is the, 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 the roots of it? How did situations degenerate to this extent? Because the Bible says God creates all things and all things he creates are good. He is the God of light and not the God of darkness. Yet the story begins with chaos that we know that God did not create. Hallelujah. He didn't make the earth without form and void. But you know what? God did not offer us an explanation for the chaos. He simply delivers the solution. Is there somebody here what I'm saying? Yes, he simply skips all the pity party. Skips all the analysis. Skips all the critical examination. Skips all of those things that hold us bound. And just says, let there be light. And there was light. An order and structure came to the universe. You see, the story did not begin with glory. The Bible begins with a fight for the right, a requirement for restoration. No explanation was given for the predicament. No reason was stated for what went wrong. God, full of glory and splendor and majesty, simply steps in and makes a declaration that changes everything. He declares the solution and not the problem. He speaks into what he wants to see happen and not why the situation had occurred. This is the time for us to end the pity party, to stop feeling sorry for yourself and begin to speak as God speaks. Let God in you arise and let his enemies be scattered. You see another depiction of this story in 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning from verse 1. And it's the story of David. They had gone out to war. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and they had smitten it and burnt it with fire. And they had taken the women captives that were therein, and they slew not any, either great nor small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until there was no more power to weep. There's nothing wrong with weeping. There's nothing wrong with sorrow. There's nothing wrong with being moved because of your situation, even if but for a time. Hallelujah. And David's two wives had been taken captive. And Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the son of Nabal, the Carmanite. And David was de greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. This is double predicament. One is that he has suffered the shame of defeat and humiliation. One is that his, his, his wife and his family, not only was his city burnt to ashes, but his family had been taken captive. But even more difficult than that, while he shared the same pain as his people, the Bible says his people spoke of stoning him 
In other words, they blamed it on their leader. Hallelujah. And David was distressed beyond measure for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. But I like it when the story gets to the but. I, I, I don't know about you, but the but just tells you when things begin to shift. Hallelujah. He says, but, hey, hey, you know, I like the way the Bible will say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Some people stop there, but I wait for the but. It says, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So I wait for the but. Come on, tell your, your neighbors, I wait for the but. The shifting of the story. Hallelujah. David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved and every man for his sons and daughters. But what made things shift? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. There comes times when you have nobody to encourage you and even the people you lean on and depend on do not understand you. It's not time for you to hate them. It's not time for unforgiveness. That will only complicate matters. It will only compound matters. It will only make things worse. It's not time to play the blame game. You weren't there for me or you were there for me. No, that's not going to help the situation. That's not going to solve anything. Ah, it's the time for you to arise and encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to understand that the power the person has to comfort you is a power or an ability that is given by God. So if that person has access to God to comfort you, you also have access to God to comfort yourself. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, comfort yourself. Comfort yourself. If nobody will praise you, praise yourself. If nobody will tell you you can make it, tell yourself. If nobody is going to help you, help yourself. Yep. Hallelujah. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David said to Abiata the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me the ephod. You know the ephod is the garment of the priest. And on the chest of the ephod was sewn the gems that represented the tribes of Israel. And on it was also the Urim and the Turim, which was a form of an oracle. When you needed to know the will of God, Urim and Turim can only say yes or can say no, yes or no. So he calls for the ephod. He puts the ephod upon the priest. And the Bible says, and David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop and shall I overtake them? And God answered him by the Urim, and he said, Pursue, for thou will surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Thank you. you see, in the times of crisis, in the times of darkness, we tend to ask questions. And there's nothing wrong with questions, if and only if they are the right questions. When it came for the shifting, when it came for the story from becoming destruction to becoming deliverance. When it was going to shift from becoming a test to becoming a testimony. When the bot shows up and it becomes not just a mess, but a message. It begins with us asking the right question, not the wrong one. You see, the wrong question is trying to find out why and analyze. And it's a temptation of the flesh. It's when we begin to play the blame game. Who's, who was responsible for it? It was because, it was because, it was because. But it was because doesn't solve anything. If only I had done this when this was that. If only I had done that when that was this. Yeah, it's because this person wasn't there for me. It was because this person didn't support me. It was because I didn't know about this. Somebody should have told me. It was because, it was because. And it was because, uh, why did this happen? Only paralyzes us the more. Because it makes us more aware of our weakness rather than help us to see our strength. It helps us to see and magnify the problem rather than showing us the solution. But David asked the right question. In different words, he asked 
What must I do to be saved? You see, that's the real question that you need to ask. That's the real question your heart should turn to. What do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? What is your charge for me, O oh Lord? What do I need to do now? You remember the pool of Siloam? There was a man who was, the Bible says, sick with a palsy, and he had been there for 26 or is it 28 years? In the same pool, the Bible says in a season, any, you know, unpredictable season. You couldn't tell whether it was going to happen 6 a.m. in the morning or 9 o'clock at night. You didn't know if it was going to be on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. There was no way to, to know when God will move. But the Bible says when the angel came, it troubled the water. And the water will begin to bubble and, be, and begin to become active. And whoever was the first to step inside the water would be the one to be healed of his situation. And here is this man who had been there, done that. He had been there hung around, and nothing happened for him. Jesus comes to that place of encounter, and he meets this man, and he asks the man the relevant question. Will you be made whole? Because that's the solution. Do you want to be healed? Do you know what the man does? He says, sir, you don't understand. I have to explain the genesis of this situation. You see, I have been here now 25 years. In fact, in the first year, I, I can name the names of the first people who came. They were the ones I was before them. In fact, Mrs. So-so and so, who is now, you know, able to see. She used to be blind. I was here before her. You don't know, but I've been here. We are the chairman of this, 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 this well and spring of water. He said, the problem is there is no democracy happening here. People are not following ethics. That's the situation. <laughs> It should be turn by turn. Everybody should be able to conduct themselves decently and this and that. Analysis, analysis, analysis. It says, I've been here all of this while. But every time that this, the spirit of God moves upon the waters, instead of people to help me because it should be my turn, they go and help themselves. Human nature will be human nature. Excuse me. You see, he assumed that his help is embedded or is predicated upon Jesus' understanding of the situation. What he didn't know is that Jesus understood the situation even before he was born. Even before the situation happened. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And sometimes we forget whom with which we have to do. To realize that the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. That he was before all things. And he knows all things. And that he upholds all things by the word of his power. We fail to understand that. We think he has the same limitations that we have in our minds. So we, we have to take it upon ourselves to think it through and explain it to him. How silly. Here is deliverance himself standing in front of you. Will you be made whole? And he has to recite all kinds of stories. Sometimes we fix ourselves into that situation. And when God doesn't fit into the box that we have preconceived that our deliverance is packaged in, we lose completely on the move of God. He says, you don't understand God. If, if, if my application had gone first complete with this and that, then this would have happened, that would have happened. Do you really think he's interested in all of that? Like he doesn't know? Like he doesn't know? You see, the bot is hinged upon asking the right question. What do I need to do now? Yes, I've messed up, but what do I need to do? now yes i've blown it but what do i need to do now my reputation is damaged but what do i need to do now my heart is bleeding but what do i need to do now 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 is the day of salvation hallelujah i'm broke i'm busted and disgusted but what do i need to do now God doesn't wait for there to be an explanation to the situation before he's moved. His hand is not tied. He's not a man. Hallelujah. He's not limited to save, neither by many 
nor by few. That's the God that we serve. It is my conviction that as we consult with our maker, the one with whom we have to do, he sends us his word. The Bible says, and he sent his word and he healed them. He has given us the holy scriptures from whence we can discern his will on every situation at hand. And all we have to do is ask like David, shall I pursue them? Should I apply? Should I go for it? What must I do now to be saved? How do we proceed from here? What steps should we take from this point forward? What must I do to be saved? Hallelujah. So I've come to help you change your mind. They ask the same question. What shall we do to be saved? Repent. First thing. Repent means change your mind. So God wants us to change our mind to a perspective of victory. Hallelujah. I want you to look at the book, Gospel According to St. Luke, chapter 10 and verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy. Jesus had sent them out to go and pray for people and deliverance and healing happened everywhere that they went to. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils were subject to us through your name. And he said unto them, <laughs> I beheld Satan fall. You don't know where I'm coming from. I beheld Satan fall. I, you know, you're not surprising me. They thought they were CNN. They were BBC coming to tell God, man, you don't know what happened. Ah, sit down there. You never see. Every time we use your name, every time we spoke in your name, even the devils obeyed us. Jesus laughed and said, me that you are giving the news, I was there when he fell from heaven. I beheld Satan fall. But behold, look and see. I give you power. To tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Most Christians have never heard this. You say, oh no, I've heard it numerous times. I can challenge you that you haven't. You've heard it with your ears, but you have not heard it with your heart. Behold, saith God, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all, not some, all, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means. I mean, can you imagine the tautology at play here? I mean, it's not to say, and nothing shall harm you. He says, and nothing shall by any means. Because we get hung up in the means. You don't understand. These people came with three demons. They could as well have come with a hundred. It doesn't matter. Nothing shall by any means. No, 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 no. You don't understand. This one is ancestral curse. It goes back two generations. In my, God says nothing shall by what? Any means. Hurt you. Notwithstanding, that's not the big deal. Oh. That one is a benefit of the real deal. The real deal it says, nevertheless, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, which they are, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It is a side effect of salvation. It is a side effect. It's a byproduct. It's a fruit of the soteria, the deliverance of God in our lives, that the spirits are subject. You know, Africans in particular, we are so spirit conscious, demon conscious, battle conscious. 
warfare conscious. We're fighting one enemy that we cannot see all the time. All the time. We are conscious of the ones that we are conscious and the ones that we are unconscious. <laughs> Yet the Bible tells us that I will not be afraid of the terror by night not the arrow that flyeth by day do you understand what that means he says you won't be afraid of the one you see coming the arrow by day or the one you don't see coming the terror by night and we are so busy the one of omission the one of commission the ones i know and the ones i don't know oh lord oh lord god says nothing shall by any means harm you i want you to look at mark chapter 16 verse 20 that mark 16 verse 15 to 20 and he said unto his disciples go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and he that is that believes and is baptized shall be saved but he that believe not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe he didn't say these signs shall follow them that are sinless. He didn't say these signs shall follow them that are spiritually mature. He didn't say these signs shall follow them that are without flaw. He didn't say these signs shall follow them that are very, very old in the Lord. He didn't say these signs shall follow them that are super spiritual. He simply says these signs shall follow them that believe the good news that he has given us power over power says in my name they shall cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take off serpents and they will drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt them they shall lay their hands upon the sick and they shall recover i receive it father so then after the lord has spoken up unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of god why because what else do you need i mean what else do you need now he's sitting. He's not standing. He's sitting. He's not warring. He has warred. Now he's sitting. And only when they understood that, look at the next verse. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. Number one, when we look closely at this verse, what do we see? Number one, it was those who have just believed. Notice the context. He says, go into the world and preach the, the, the gospel to all creatures. And then these signs shall follow those that believe the gospel you have just preached. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? These signs will follow that newborn believer. <laughs> Hallelujah. The only precondition is that you believe and you are baptized. And I would say, I said, the Bible lists three kinds of baptism. Baptism into the body of Christ, which comes when you are saved. You are automatically baptized into the body of Christ. Then baptism in water, also known as the baptism of John. And then baptism in the Holy Spirit. So which baptism guarantees you this power over power? It's subject to theological debates. Rather than debates, I would rather just get all three since all three are available to me Amen. hallelujah Amen. acts chapter 2 verse 38 and peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the holy ghost for the promises unto you and your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the lord our god will call Number three thing you have to note in this scripture. It is that it is in the name of Jesus. Excuse me. That these signs will follow us. It is only in our submission to the authority of Christ. That these signs will follow us. It is not by our own power. Nor is it by our own might. Nor is it by our merit. It is a commission. We are ambassadors on the commission. The power of the kingdom backs us up. Hallelujah. 
mantolo do bokoya. The spirit are subject to you. I want you to think deeply about that. The spirits are subject to you. Hupostaso, that's what the word subject means, to subordinate. It means to obey. It means to be under, to be in obedience, to put under, to subdue, to put into subjection. Hallelujah. The spirits are subject to you. If I will break it down, you've got to understand how this works. It says, behold, I give you unto you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. If you go and look into your concordance, you'll find out that two different words were used there. One is the word exousia, the other is the word dunamis. I give unto you exousia over all the dunamis of the enemy. Now those two words have a completely different meaning. They are translated power, power. But if you read in some of the modern translation, NIV, New Living Translation, you see that it says, and I will give unto you, I have given unto you authority over the power of the enemy. So, ex exousia is authority. What is authority? Authority, literally speaking, is that which tells power what to do. What is power? Power is the ability, is equivalent to energy, the ability to accomplish work. The physical strength, the capacity to achieve. That's power, that's dynamis. It's the root word from which we get dynamite. Power loaded. But it's not power now that is the issue. It is authority. Hallelujah. So we have authority over power. Can I say that again? We have authority over power. Satan has no authority. That's why all he flashes to us is random displays of power. You are trying to cast out the devil. He will scream with a loud voice. Even with Jesus, he did that. You know what that is? A display of power. Foam in the mouth. Jump up. Maybe even the bed will float. I don't know what he wants to do. <laughs> All of that is nothing but displays of power. Jesus says, I've given you authority Hallelujah. over power. Hallelujah. When a traffic warden stops you on the road, it's not the stature of the man that makes you stop it's what he represents or should i rather say it's who he represents even if he's alone at the junction and he says stop and you don't stop it's not necessarily that officer that will call you to judgment there's an entire system is there somebody hearing what i'm talking about maybe it's the flashing of a camera Maybe there's another car parked just a little bit further down that is watching and sees your infringement. The poor fellow you almost cleared off the road may not be able to do anything to you, but that car might pursue you, find you, pin you down, take you to court, and the judge's gavel will go down upon you, and it's a prison sentence for being stupid. You violated authority and the entire force of the system comes to bear on your behalf. That's what we are. We are ambassadors to go in the name of Christ to exercise authority over power. Folks, I want you to understand that there are certain powers that have been run, running rampant in your life. But God has given us authority. And authority means that you can speak Speak a thing. You can decree a thing. And it shall be established. This is the time for us to begin to speak to those visa offices. This is the time for us to speak to those schools. This is the time for us to speak to that examination board. This is the time we need to begin to speak to those closed doors. This is not the time for analysis. This is not the time for one done searching of heart. This is not the time for thinking if I could, if I should, if I would. This is the time to take your place and take hold of that authority that has been given to you in Christ and begin to issue commands like a king that you are. Hallelujah. For he has given us authority over power. P 
people are often shocked by the magnitude of authority that is available to and through them. The 70 were amazed and expected Jesus to be impressed by their reports. Instead, Jesus pointed them to the fact that the boss of all evil spirits fell from heaven by the power and the will of God without Jesus lifting a finger. I beheld Satan fall. He goes on to express that this is far more impressive to realize that our names are written in heaven and that it is our redemption that guarantees us authority over power. In other words, your redemption is far weightier and costs more than your walking in spiritual authority. So be confident to arise into the fullness of this stature. It is more difficult to conquer the human will than it is to defeat the devil. Don't be hung up. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. It says, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of, of your flesh, has he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross and having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles, the deceit of the devil. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world of this age against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Wiles means trick, a stratagem intended to ensnare and deceive and to stop you, a bullying tactic that stops you from using the authority that is your birthright in Jesus. A playful trick of outwitting another. That's all he can try on you. Hallelujah. Oh, Mahantolo Borona Mahantale Giberona. The battlefield is in our thoughts and in our minds, brethren. It's a war for our thoughts. It's time for us to arise and to exercise authority over power. Some of these things that have been chasing us is our turn to begin to chase out. Is there somebody here what I'm saying? Let's chase out depression. Let's chase out anxiety. Let's chase out poverty. Let's chase out discouragement. For we have authority over power. Tell discouragement where to go. Let's chase out failure. Tell it failure. You don't belong in this house. So clear your load. I'm not yours. Go. Authority over power. Precious Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the power of your word. And I thank you for that brother and that sister that is listening to me. I thank you that today we understand that we have power over power. Lord, that you have done this for us. Mantolo palo ke mamosote palo renage. We receive deliverance, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now I'm here to encourage you and to challenge you to release that which is in your hand that we may see the outpouring of that which is in God's hand. Every time that I cry, you hear Because God is faithful. And no matter the Every times day, that we'll find ourselves in, we have a reason to rejoice because our God delivers us from you every affliction. Every time when I call for help, you're there for me. And because we trust him, we come to him with confidence. And it's a time to give. And you woke me up this morning. 
We give first of all because we honor the Lord because He's our Lord. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I am grateful. You've been so faithful. You've been so faithful to me. You have been faithful. God not out of compulsion. Some people think that at a time of pressure is a time when you hoard and you hold back. It's a time to keep because you don't know what would happen. But I challenge you when you dare to release your faith, to give unto God, you are giving God an opportunity to manifest. When you died, what can I say? Lord, you forgive me again, not again. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I just want to testify. If you want to glorify, you are the one who makes me sing. You make, you make me sing my heart away. away. Lord, I am grateful to you. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It means it takes submission to his lordship to connect with his care. You have been faithful. Lord, I am grateful. Lord, I am grateful. I want to encourage you right now to join us if you are persuaded to do so. Give right now, and uh, as I speak, uh, the number and the account details is being scrolled through your screen. Pick up your device. Oh, I know it's already with you. Make that transfer now, and God will bless you in the name of Jesus. tremendously blessed in this service my life will never remain the same i know the same is with you also wherever you are watching us from now before you go don't forget like our facebook page and every time you connect go a step further to share that page to your friends and on your, on your own timeline so you help us take this service further and help many more people to connect with us faster thank you so much Till we'll see you next time. God bless you.